Hello and welcome to episode two of the Slip and Weave podcast. My name is Dakota. Uh, happy to be with you again today. This is my uh, second go at this. Uh, the first week, I talked a bunch of fights. I felt like it went really well. I felt really comfortable and uh, I've appreciated the, the feedback from people who have listened and uh, have reached out to me. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing this. Like I said last week, I hope I can just keep getting better at it and, you know, um, over time, you know, like anything, it's like, it's like boxing. It's like anything, you know, you do something a bunch of times and you're bound to get better at it. Um, so normally in my mind, when I first started doing this, I I sort of thought that maybe this would start exclusively as a boxing podcast, but this week we lost, uh, an icon in the basketball world and Kobe Bryant. Um, and I just, I feel like I don't even really know what to say about it. I was really sad about it. I'm still pretty sad about it. Um, you know, thanks Kobe. Thanks for, thanks for all the good, uh, the thrilling moments. I guess that's the, the best thing you can say. Cause he was, uh, he was a true spectacle. Anytime you watch Kobe Bryant in the playoffs, it was this like unique experience watching this guy who's just knows he's the man. And I remember the first, you know, I watched basketball as a little kid, but I remember the first series that I really cared about was the Pistons against the Lakers in 2004 in the finals. I was 11 years old. Um, And that was a really cool series. It was a good introduction to the sport. Obviously the Lakers lost, but just seeing Kobe and Shaq and and Chauncey and Ben Wallace and Rip Hamilton, all those guys in their primes, it was, you know, I was pretty much drawn into the sport, and Kobe was a big part of that. Very special guy, very tragic thing that happened. So, um, yeah, I feel horrible for his family and for anyone involved, you know. It's awful. He's truly an icon. There's not a lot of people that you can actually say are icons. Um and he is one of those people. He is, you know, my generation's Michael Jordan, all the millennials. You know, if you crumpled up a ball of paper and you shot it in the trash, what'd you say? You said, Kobe. Kobe. And it's always going to be like that. So rest in peace, Kobe. We love you. Um, so, yeah, there was some pretty good fights in the last week and a half or so. There was a good card on Showtime on January 25th. There was uh, Jarrett Hurd versus Francisco Santana at 154. And Danny Garcia against a guy named Ivan Redcatch. The first fight uh, between Hurd and Santana, um, I, obviously, I, I had heard that, you know, Hurd had turned down a rematch with Julian Williams. This was his first fight coming back since his first loss against Julian Williams. I heard he turned down that rematch. I, I'm not entirely sure why. Um, but I know that he was going through some changes in his camp and he's in a new place with some new people. I don't really know much more than that, but that was sort of the sense I got. And it was interesting cause he, he boxed a very, uh, a very technical fight. You know, he uses jab from the outside for the most part. There's a lot of good head movement, a lot of good shoulder rolls. There was a couple of spots where him and Santana sort of sat in the pocket and traded. Um, and Santana was so the right opponent, you know, for what Hurd was looking for. It was a guy who was really tough, who was going to give him some rounds, who could keep a certain um, pace and could give him, you know, enough activity for him to work on some things defensively and also not be like a big hitter, be too dangerous coming up from welterweight, but being durable, being durable enough to hang, which is what he did. But Hurd, I thought, was very um, – he boxed very clean. I thought he was trying to work on some stuff. You could see he's trying to make a stylistic shift from just sort of in the pocket, grind it out, lose the first six rounds, you know, and then knock you out in the last half of the fight. You know, I could see he's trying to make a transition out of that. Um, so, but it was weird. I felt like the announcers were being a little impatient with him, the Showtime guys. I think they wanted a little more action out of him, which I understand. You know, people, people see you fight a certain style. And that's what they expect. Um, and at some point, he may have to fight somebody that, you know, he doesn't have that option to 
it's a boxing move that makes him fight. You know, he may he may run into that at some point, but to be able to build that repertoire and work on it, I thought it was a very successful performance. He was also able to drop Santana in the last round. So overall, you know, he didn't take a lot of punishment. I thought he worked on some stuff, put the guy on his ass. I thought it was a, a good performance for Jared Hurd. 154 is awesome right now. It's a great weight class. Um, it seems like the titles are there's not there's not a, a, a top dog. There's like six seven guys that have some level of claim to that or are mixing it up already. And you know Charlo and Harrison splitting two fights. You know Heard losing to Williams, but then Williams losing to Rosario. You got Arislandi Lara and you know Brian Castaño, Patrick Texera. There's a it's a it's a really really stacked division right now. 154 pounds. Um, so yeah, big up to Jared Hurd. The main event was Danny Garcia and Ivan Redcatch. Um, Danny, you know, Danny had the two losses, uh, to Sean Porter and to Keith. And he came back last April and made pretty easy work of Adrian Granados. I thought he looked good in that fight. I thought he looked equally good in this fight. He boxed real good, technical when he needed to. He walked the guy down when he needed to and put his hands together. I think one of the big drawbacks about Danny Garcia is sometimes it feels like he's looking for the perfect shot and he's sort of stands in the pocket without a lot of foot movement, you know, sort of waiting for you to make a move. And a lot of times, like when Keith fought him, he would rip off like two, three fast ones, and Danny would answer with one hard one. But sometimes Keith would already be out, you know what I mean? So it always feels like maybe Danny's activity could be a little better. And I think his last two fights, you know, obviously against slightly lesser opposition. But Granados has given some top guys good fights. So uh, I think that was probably, you know, the level of dominance of that uh, was pretty impressive. Um, and this fight, I thought he basically won every round. He was really, really crisp. He looked like an elite fighter. You know, he's being talked about to fight either Pacquiao or Spence. Why not? You know what I mean? Um, I feel like he would be a good fight for Spence, uh, stylistically. I think he would give Spence some problems because he's such a sharp shooter and he is good at making you pay. He, he is a very, very slick counter puncher, but sometimes it's just with one, you know, and if he can learn how to, you know, land that good one or maybe like, to, you know, add, just add to the one because um, he's such a good counter puncher. He's got great fast twitch. He's got great defense. He's, he is very tricky to hit clean, um, particularly with, with the first shot. You almost can never hit him with the first shot. Um, so I think he gives Pacquiao or Spence a great fight. I don't. I think that the fact that all these PBC guys are in are in the mix together is great. I would love to see Garcia fight Terrence Crawford. That's really the fight that I would like to see only because, and I talked about this on the first episode, I'm dying to see Crawford in with somebody relevant at welterweight. And I think Danny Garcia is the perfect candidate for it. Um so that was a good card. There was another card on, it was weird. It was on a Thursday and it was a big card. There was a bunch of fights on it. It was on the zone. Um, the first one that really mattered was Daniel Roman and a guy named MJ Akhmadaliev, uh, from Uzbekistan. I had never heard of Akhmadaliev, but he was one of those, you know, Eastern European guys with not that many professional fights, but a big amateur pedigree. I'd seen Roman a bunch. He's got, you know, real, he's like sort of the new school Mexican style where he's right in the pocket, but his defense is real good and responsible. He doesn't take a lot of stuff like clean um, on the way in. He's not looking to just stand and trade, but he is on the front foot. That was a great matchup, man. That was top level stuff. Um, The... Roman ultimately was landing more shots. Akhmadaliev kind of looked like he was maybe landing the harder shots and he got a split decision. I don't know how I felt about that. I thought if any fight looked like a draw, that was the one. It didn't feel like any guy ever, either guy ever pulled ahead or separated, you know, himself from the other. But it was a great fight. I hope they do a rematch as soon as possible because, the, you know, 122, there's a, there's a lot of good fighters right now. Um, and I think that those two guys are kind of made for each other. So 
hopefully they get that on as soon as possible. Um, following that was Tevin Farmer against Jojo Diaz. I was so surprised at how flat Farmer looked. Um, and I hate to say that because I'm a big fan of his. He's such a, a slick defensive fighter. But he was pretty easy to hit for the most part. Um, obviously, Diaz is a level up in competition from you know, some of the guys Farmer has been fighting. So that's to be expected, you know, that Diaz is going to be able to maybe land a little bit more. I think he has some nice punching power too. So, you know, he hits Farmer and sort of, you know, shocks him and, he, you know, he's got to kind of gather himself. Whereas the last guy he fought, uh, uh, Frenois, you know, that guy couldn't hurt him even if he was standing right in front of him. He didn't, didn't have the, the skill set to set, set it up either. Whereas Diaz has all of those things. He has the power and the, the skills to set it up, the speed to set it up. Um, and Farmer just couldn't really react. I was really surprised. He never, he didn't, there wasn't another gear he could kick it into. And maybe he was a little weight drained because I, he, he kind of looked like it. He looked like a guy who couldn't really react, who couldn't get it into that gear he needed to get it into, um, to be that slippery boxer and to be able to, you know, outmaneuver Jojo, which is kind of what I thought he would be able to do. But big ups to Jojo Diaz. I, you know, they talked about doing a rematch for that. I know Farmer has a rematch clause. But I don't know about that one, man. Tevin looked pretty uh, pretty worn out. He, you know, he's so active. You got to wonder if, you know, maybe either making the weight all the time or, you know, whatever. Maybe he's just a little burnt out. Maybe he needs a little time off. Um, and some guys, that's hard to do. It's hard for them to turn it off. So... I hope he gets the rest or whatever he needs to come back the way he needs to come back because he's a great fighter. I really like watching him. So um, I thought just purely on matchup, um, on paper, that was the most interesting fight of the card. Before the main event, which really bummed me out, was another one of these fucking YouTube fights. Um, a guy named Jake Paul against, I, I think his name is Anison Gibb. I don't know what he does or what he's about. He's not a boxer though. I could tell you that. Um, and, and basically, um, these two non-athletes, uh, share the spotlight with real boxers. And I don't really understand the value of that. I don't understand why I, the zone is trying to shove that down our throats. I think if they want to make that its own separate thing and make cards of just that, that's a different thing. But the idea of shoving, you know, YouTube guys down our throats and expecting that real boxing fans are going to appreciate that or respect that, or even thinking that that's respectful of the other fighters on the card. You know, the fact that that would come after Roman and Akhmadaliev and those two guys have boxed their whole lives, I think is very, very fucking disrespectful. Um, so that was unfortunate. I'm, you know, I hope Eddie Hearn stops that fucking shit because it's real whack. Um, but I, I bet we're going to keep getting them. I bet they're going to keep popping up because I think he truly believes that it's about getting new fans. But I think particularly if you look back at Logan Paul and KSI, you know, I think if he thinks that anybody thought that fucking Billy Joe Saunders was riveting, that there was new Billy Joe Saunders fans after that. I think he is dead wrong. I think they don't even remember who else was on the card now. That's what I think. So be careful about trying to get anybody to watch the sport because these guys risk their fucking lives, man. You can't front like this is the same shit. It's not the same shit. It's not the same shit. These guys aren't athletes. You know, it's very frustrating. Um, so I hope they stop doing that. Uh, so moving on the main event of that card was Demetrius Andrade and Luke Keeler. Um, and Keeler is, was just not at, at that elite level. The truth was Andrade looked a little sloppy early on. He, he tagged him within the first, maybe three seconds of the fight and put him down. And I think he just got a little, you know, inebriated by the idea of that, you know, I got to hit this guy. I got to knock him out. So there was a couple of rounds in there where he was winging wide shots. He looked a little sloppy. But once he really settled in and he started to do his thing, 
it was very obvious the class difference. Keeler showed some balls, but he just didn't have the tools to to cope with everything that Android was bringing to him. You know, the defense on the way in, the punching power, the hand speed, um, the ability to mix it up front foot, back foot. So, uh, Android's a really special fighter. What I want to know is how can we get this kid a big fucking fight? That's ridiculous. You know, I don't know why he's fighting Luke Keeler. The kid's got a title. He's one of the three or four best middleweights in the world. I don't think anyone's arguing that. Apparently, Eddie Hearn sent Jamal Charlo a contract for $7 million, and he turned it down. So I, I don't really understand it. I don't know if he has to move up in weight where guys think he's a little, he maybe he's less dangerous and they don't care. Um, you know, that's always a risk that's worth taking. It looks like maybe he has the frame to move up to super middleweight, light heavyweight. But I don't know. It does kind of feel like these guys are ducking him. You know, Mangia got done with his fight the other night and a couple of weeks ago. He didn't even mention the kid's name. He was like, yo, I want the big fights, Canelo, Charlo, whoever. And he didn't even say Andre, bro. Like, that's crazy. That's crazy. So I, I really hope Andre can get a big fight. He's on the same promotion as a lot of these middleweights, the zone, Eddie Hearn. So hopefully he can get one. I would really like to see it. Hopefully, like I said, I want to see him and Golovkin. I said that in the last episode. Um... So I'm hoping we get to see that sooner than later. Maybe, maybe it's somebody from the lower weight moving up, Jarrett Hurd. I think Jarrett Hurd and Andrade would be a great fight. I've been saying that would be a great fight. Why not? Um, so yeah, it was a good, uh, it was a good, good week of fights. The last fight I want to talk about it was on this, that following Saturday, February first, I believe. Um, your Dennis Ugas beat uh, Mike Dallas. Mike Dallas is a decent fighter, but um, I think that Ugas is potentially, not potentially, Ugas is an elite level welterweight, who I think is a handful for anybody in the weight class. I think stylistically he's real difficult to deal with because he's right in the pocket and he's very sharp. He's got that um, that textbook uh, that textbook Cuban technique, you know, from their amateur system that's so good. Um, and he had that great fight with Sean Porter. He was really tough in that fight. I liked him a lot in that fight. I thought he won. And I think, you know, I think him and Danny Garcia is a tremendous matchup. They fought, you know, within a week of each other. I think that that's a matchup that they can make, both me and PBC. Um, I think the winner of that fight is without a doubt eligible for a a huge mega fight. Um, So maybe that's potential, potentially a matchup that could be made. Um, Next weekend... Uh, this actually tomorrow, today is Friday, uh, February 7th. Tomorrow we have Gary Russell against, I don't think if I had, if there was a million dollars on the line, I could say this guy's name, right? I believe his name is Tugstot Nayambayar. I'm very sorry. I don't mean to disrespect this guy by saying his name improperly. I just don't know how to say it. Um, and he's from Mongolia. I watched some YouTube footage of him and he's very talented. I don't know if he can beat Gary Russell, but he's a very talented kid. It should be a good fight. Um, Guillermo Guillermo Rigondeau is going to be on that undercard against Liborio Solis. Always good to see Rigondeau. It'll be interesting to see how much he has left. Last fight, I, I watched him. He, he It was a little easier to hit him than it used to be. But, uh, you know, hopefully he comes in sharp. Also, next week is the return of Kel Brook, uh, who has not fought since the end of 2018. I think he's had some injuries, some, you know, some battles with depression after taking losses to Golovkin um, and Errol Spence. Um, but Kel Brook is a great fighter. I really look forward to uh, to seeing him again, that fight being on the zone. Um, so, yeah, check out Kel Brook next weekend, man. Hopefully he can get himself in line for a big fight, maybe even with Danny Garcia or Ugas or one of those welterweights or maybe somebody up at 154. It's a lot of options for a guy like Kel Brook. Um, so yeah, that's it guys. Thanks for listening to episode two of the slip and weave podcast. Uh, great being with you again. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next week.